My name is Rebecca Hoagman. I'm a second year student for the Art Study Program. Uh, my internship is at the Student Alumni Affairs, which is how I am uh, honored to be part of this. Um, today I'd like to introduce Shira Felberell, that's her name for me, uh, who will be moderating today. Perfect. So I also am a second year MSW student at NYU School of Social Work. And um, I've been working very closely with the Gerontology Student Collective, which is basically a group of students who, a number of years actually before I joined here, decided that within the curriculum, the topic of geriatrics wasn't really um, represented to the extent that they wanted to see it have a place. And so a couple of students have continued to work together to sponsor different events, co sponsor different events, and this is this one um, with the alumni and the student affairs population. And um, we continue to meet periodically, so I'm in this capacity representing the Gerontology Students Collective, kind of a grassroots kind of organization. So again, I want to welcome everybody. I see people keep joining. Please feel free to join and take a seat around the table. So today's a really interesting opportunity to spend a little bit of time welcoming three alumni who have a chance to share with us their experience, both in terms of what they've been doing professionally since leaving NYU and also to share with us some ways that we can prepare ourselves. Maybe not everyone here to say but whatever we can learn to take forward with us. So it's a great opportunity to kind of get ourselves prepared in that respect. So in terms of today's panel, it's called Paleoc and it's a pure geriatric. And I think we'll spend a little bit of time today going through some specific questions um, targeted to address things that we thought might be of interest to the people around the table. And then we'll leave some time at the end also to have a chance to raise questions that come up that maybe as you hear our panel speak, you know, something percolating that you want to get addressed. And I think that we're also a small enough group and you know, it should be an intimate environment that if people have questions and they want to raise, we can certainly put them out there as we're having the discussion and um, people should feel free to share their thoughts. So I guess the first thing that would really be fantastic is to welcome each of our panelists and give you guys a chance to really introduce yourselves, share a little bit about your respective backgrounds and career wise, and then we'll go to some specific questions, maybe about your careers in particular, and then maybe some questions that would be more geared towards how students who are trying to enter the career and enter the profession might be curious. So we have three panelists today, three you know, speakers with us. We've got Nikki White, welcome, thank you for joining us. We've got uh, Susan Gavino, thank you, and also Darren Arthur. So why don't we begin, um, if you don't mind, to share a little bit about background, how you find out to where you are today. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All the students for second year, just so I have a No, yeah, oh, no, oh, no, 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 and I was asking as people walk through the work, but everyone is from the school of social work, is that fair? Or is there anyone who's maybe coming from a different discipline or okay. so Thanks. 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 Okay, so I'm Nikki Weiss and I graduated from uh, NYU in two thousand and four, so this is my eighth year as a social worker. And I came to uh, social work in this way. I've had a few other careers. I have been a textile designer, and then I wrote illustrated children's books for about 14 years. And then I was a teacher in the East Village at a progressive elementary school. And as I approached 50, I thought, I'm ready for a next career. And social work had been in the back burner. Um, I didn't have a focus, really, for the population that I wanted to work with, but I did have a general sense of wanting to be in the service world. Uh, I really loved being a teacher. And so I came to NYU, and uh, it was really kind of uh, fateful. Um, because I was working full time, I had, a, I had to have a place to do the evening. And so uh, NYU was kind enough to find a place in close to my home, and it was in a residence for people living with HIV and AIDS. So this was my beginning experience. I had no idea I was interested in health, that I was interested in issues of um, you know, proximity to, uh, to one's mor mortality in that way as a daily uh, event, and how just sort of managing your health and living a certain, uh, a good quality of life was the focus day to day. And I was fascinated by the work that I did in this, with this population. And it, I thought for my second year, and I have to say, at the end of my first year, I met uh, Dr. Garbino. 
and who is totally committed to uh, helping people come into the field and stay in the field. And um, so you had to support group at the time, and I made a decision for my second placement where you get to choose it. But I said, well, I'll put my money where my mouth is, and uh, if I really think I like this, I'm gonna try a hospital environment, because that will really let me know how much do I love this. And so I worked, um, was an intern at NYU in the um, intensive care uh, pediatric unit, and I loved, loved, loved the work. But I discovered I was old enough, I was uh, approaching 50, and I just realized I actually thought I didn't have the learning curve energy that I felt that uh, a hospital might take. So I thought I'd like to have, it. I spoke with the, with the group, and were there other um, uh, end, of, end of life palliative care environments that were sort of stepped down in the intensity, uh, but also might include colleagueship. And so uh, I was directed towards, I live in the city, but towards WJCS in Westchester, which is Westchester Jewish Community Services, and a very small uh, sort of, it's not, a, we don't call ourselves palliative care exactly, but we, because we only have social work, but we work with people in their homes. It's a home visiting program, and we serve people who are living with life-threatening um, illnesses, and it can be terminal illnesses, and it can be uh, uh, sort of quality of life deteriorating illnesses that they might live with for many, many years, like MS. Um, and so that's how I came to my love of this work, which was really just uh, working uh, in the population and discovering it really touched something in me and felt like a really good fit for me. And I have to say that eight years later, it's been a wonderful choice. Thank you for sharing. Dr. Maria. Hi, everyone. Um, I came to the work also sort of serendipitously. Um, thought I wanted to work with children. Um, that I had really very little aptitude for working with children in play therapy. Um, it's really true. I found that out. Um, and um, I graduated with my MSW in 1977. And in those days, it's like the, in the old days, um, you, you didn't really have much choice about your placement. So I was a work study, but I did an unpaid placement for my second year. And they said, I said, I don't care what you say, but I really don't want to go to a hospital. So, of course, I got sent to a hospital. Um, I lived in the south end of Brooklyn, um, and the hospital was what's now, uh, I think, Our Lady of Mercy. So I took the D train from one end of Brooklyn to the Bronx, because they didn't care where you lived. Um, <coughs> so things have changed. Um, and I fell in love with the work and haven't looked back. Um, so what do I love about the work? I love interdisciplinary work. I love to be on a team. Um, I love the endlessly diverse populations that you work with in palliative life care. I should say that I started out in oncology for three years, from 77 to 80. And then in 1980, um, the New York State Initiative for Hospice Care, um, and the first 15 hospices opened in Brooklyn. And the way I got the job is an interesting story. I was working with a woman for a very long time at the hospital with very chronic cancer. And she saw the time, the ad, the job ad in the Times. I didn't see it. And she said, I think you like this. I think this is a good job for you. Because <laughs> um, she and I had been railing at the powers that be about the fact that she wasn't getting out of the pain medicine. And what caught her eye in the ad had to do with advocating for, for people at end of life and who had pain. <coughs> so she gave me the, the ad. In those days, of course, they had print ads. And, um, mm -hmm. I got the job. I was chief social worker of myself. There was nobody else. <laughs> <laughs> um, chief of one. Um, and it was really a grassroots startup. It was myself. It wasn't a nurse yet. It was myself and pastoral care and our director, who was a psychologist. And we were sort of a three-person team of sorts, um, covering, running around Brooklyn. There no, was no reimbursement. There was no such thing as a hospice benefit or hospice care. So I did that for a very, very long time. Um, ended up coming here for my PhD and, and graduated from NYU in 94. So it was a big gap between my um, MSW and my PhD. And along the way, began to teach adjunct here and then got hired um, to direct our Westchester branch campus in 94, and I've been with the school since then. Um, did some adjunct teaching before 94, but I really think I've been really been fully here since 1994. 
Um, I right now direct our Zelda Foster Palliative uh, and End of Life Care program, um, which spans an MSW fellowship through an advanced leadership fellowship for people who are actually in the field leading the way. And the whole mission of that program, which is really the, the heart of what I do here, um, is to groom new social workers for this field and to develop them into leaders, leaders in, in writing for publication, uh, administration, supervision, um, really thinking about passing the torch because those of us that started in the hospice movement and it really was a movement, um, all of us are beginning to age out and so that there's a, a there's a, gonna be a workforce shortage in both geriatrics and palliative and oncology. And, and, uh, oncology, palliative and life care and geriatrics are the three big areas in social work of which there's gonna be huge workforce shortage because there's so many of us that started in palliative care that are aging, and then of course the whole population is aging, the, the baby boomer, which is the, the cohort that I'm in. Um, so this program is really to do that. I also have a small um, private practice, um, which includes home visiting, um, to people who are ill, um, either just acutely ill and will get better, uh, people living like Nikki's program with sort of ongoing um, medical illness, and I also, I also see people with a fairly complicated bereavement. Um, so that's kind of who I am, and um, I'm happy to answer questions about either the Zelda program or the work, because it's endlessly fascinating, and uh, I, I'm, I, there's never a dull one, right? <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing Thanks. Hi, so I'm Darren, and you know, I usually start when I talk about how I got into this, um, going back to my childhood, because I feel like it's sort of in my blood. Um, I was raised in the Midwest and grew up there, and, and was part of a very strong family, uh, church family, and also my uh, immediate family, um, and we always were involved with um, the folks in church who often were sick or, and or dying, and I was always fascinated by how people reacted to that, and dealt with illness and pain, suffering, and end of life. And so between my church family, which was all very big, and my immediate family, I had a lot of experience, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, um, in that area. Um, and, you know, I'm always interested, uh, one thing I talk to often with my students, because I also teach students, um, supervise students, um, is, you know, how many people have touched a dead body, seen a dead body, um, you know, and, and I started doing that when I was about this tall. Um, and something just captured me in all of that. And so I, I started there because that's where I started with this line of work, even though this is my second career. Um, you know, I also say that I read Kubler-Ross um, when I was in high school, which might be some weird, and hopefully all of you know who Kubler-Ross is. Um, but then my actual work, um, if you will, was actually as a volunteer at GMHC as a paralegal in their um, uh, planning, estate planning division, I guess it's called, and helping folks, uh, and this is early on in, in the HIV AIDS epidemic, but helping people to plan and, and uh, figure out what they were going to do with their lives, what was left of them. Um, and so along the way, I sort of found that I had a passion for all this work and really wanted to do it. Um, but I went a different direction and sort of went into um, profit and nonprofit work in management, operations, finance, completely different from social work. But it was always there. I was doing volunteer work and doing lots of different things. And at some point it came along that, uh, you know, why, what am I doing? This is not my passion. My passion's over there. And so at 38, I jumped ship and uh, started my second career. Um, so now I've been doing it for over 10 years, almost 10 years. Um, so in graduate school, I, my second year placement, sort of like Nikki, I pushed hard to get what I think was the first ever um, student intern on a palliative care team in a hospital setting was at NYU Medical Center. And um, I had to lobby hard. Um, and I actually went and visited them and was like, I want to do this, how can I get on your team? And I came back here and said, they want me, so how can we do this? <laughs> so I manipulated everybody to get what I wanted, basically. Um, but got on, and it was uh, life changing. And I often say to folks, you know, when they, on that last day of my internship, they literally had to push me out of the hospital. I sat in the lobby for an hour, kind of crying in some ways. So I was like, I don't want to leave. This has been profound, and I love the work that I did there. And uh, they were like, okay, Darren, it's time to go. <laughs> um, had to turn my badge in, and it was, yeah, it was, it was tough. 
Um, so, but I did it because I knew, I think I, I had to find out where this is what I want. I knew I had a passion for it. I liked the subject matter. I liked working with folks who had illnesses and were facing their mortality. But could I do this as a job? Um, and so getting an internship is a perfect way to do it. It's not your work. Um, you're figuring out for yourselves whether this is something you can do and want to do and are good at or not. And, um, and, and that, that, that's what happened for me. But coming out of graduate school that I knew I would really want to, and I would certainly encourage everyone to, um, your first job out is you can get a mental health job, get your clinical skills honed very well. That will take you in whatever direction you want to go in. And so that's what I did. But I was also fortunate in that first job. I had a job that split two programs. One was uh, just general mental health, and the other was uh, working with individuals and families uh, that had HIV and AIDS. And so that kind of began my sort of formal work in working in Pali with an end-of-life care issues. Um, and then I jumped ship about five and a half years ago and still am at um, Beth Israel Medical Center in their outpatient cancer center as an oncology social worker and um, <coughs> loving it. And I've been teaching students there. I had uh, eight students that I've worked with, uh, social work intern students. And, um, Right now, uh, I, I went through Dr. Gabino's uh, course, the certificate program in Thai End of Life Care. And um, I also worked at Gillis Club, thanks to Dr. Gabino. Because when I graduated in 2003, I didn't have a lot of group experience. And, uh, and someone suggested I would speak to her. And she, uh, she's got a connection with Gillis Club. And I don't know if you all know what Gillis Club is. Gilda Radner was a comedian and actress who was on Saturday Night Live. She was Anna Dana. Dana. But she starts. She had cancer. She started a, a, an organization called Gills Club, and it really um, helps children and, and adults um, who are uh, have cancer or are affected by cancer. And they run groups and trainings and support programs for them. And so there's one here in New York. It's on Houston Street. And I've been facilitating groups for them for the last eight nine years. Um, and uh, this spring, I am really excited about offering the first ever uh, here in New York and maybe nationally. I don't, we're not really sure. We, have, we can't find a one that's being offered anywhere else. But we do have the one year certificate program in private and life care. But what we're going to offer this spring is sort of an intro to clinical practices um, that are focused in palliative and end of life care. Um, for folks who have an interest but aren't fully decided they want to go into the field, or they may be working in a private practice and you know you never know who's going to walk through your door, and you want to have a certain skill set about working with end of life issues or palliative care issues. Um, so that's coming up. Um, I'll stop there. Looking forward to questions. I'm thinking a theme that sort of emerged that I've heard so far is really passion, like the sense of finding your niche, maybe not going to exactly what you thought you were going to go, maybe going to a place even if you thought, oh, that's not for me, and then really finding, despite having an experience, how rewarding it is, and continuing with it. And I guess the other thing I heard was the diversity um, in the experiences. And I thought maybe that was a good segue for a moment. You each thrown around some terms. And I'm not sure that everyone has the same level of background and knowledge. And I thought perhaps since this panel is really about palliative care, end of life hospice, and general geriatrics and um, aging, I thought maybe um, either each of you or one of you could spend a little bit of time just sort of defining those terms for us and getting into something that maybe we're kind enough to provide. Yeah, actually, for those of you who came in a little bit later, I do have a form here that I kind of put down some definitions of palliative care and sort of what the key aspects are of palliative care because it's such a sort of a nebulous thing even for a lot of folks who have worked in it for years. Um, there's lots of definitions, but some of these are some of the key definitions and some of the aspects of palliative care. So. Maybe that's a good place to start, but just for everyone that knows the distinctions between how they sort of are tangentially related, they overlap a little, and then what really separates them from each other. If you think about palliative care as sort of the umbrella of providing care, to anybody with an illness, from diagnosis to cure, or from diagnosis to remission, to diagnosis to recurrence, to diagnosis to death. Um, and the whole goal of palliative care, I'm just talking about palliative care first, is to relieve symptom burden, to provide multidisciplinary care to patients and families. The patient and family is the unit of care. Um, and it, it's aggressive symptom management, whether that's psychosocial symptom, pain and pain, other kinds of symptoms, spirituality. Um, so it's a team approach, and 
Most people equate palliative with end-of-life care, and they, it is not the same thing. So our certificate program is called Postpartum Certificate in Palliative and End-of-Life Care. End-of-life care is a slice, if you will, of palliative care, and it most often refers to <coughs> hospice care, where you have to have a six-month or less diagnosis, uh, prognosis, and so you are you are in the dying phase of palliative care. Um, so. That, the big, I think, concern, concern and confusion is, is that most people think palliative care and hospice are the same thing. So they say, I can't go on palliative care. I'm still getting aggressive chemotherapy. I'm still looking at aggressive treatment for my MS. So how can I go on palliative care? But yet I have pain. I have unremitting pain. I have chronic pain. I have acute pain. I, I'm nauseous all the time. I've got cognitive problems from the chemotherapy. I have spiritual questions about why this is happening to me. And they don't get to palliative care, and that is like the perfect person to come to palliative care, because they think it means I have to have a six month for hospice, you do have to have a six month or less progress, and you cannot be taking aggressive treatment. Aggressive meaning aggressive curative treatment. Hospice care and palliative care is extremely aggressive treatment. It's just aggressive comfort care. It's aggressive symptom management. Um, it's often portrayed as, You've now exhausted everything we can do for you, so we're bringing in palliative care, we're bringing in hospice care, as if we're like this last resort that after the medical team has done it, all their magic, now we're bringing in the death squad. Um, and it's really distressing, because what happens, I hear on the bereavement end of my practice and in all of my work over the years, and I'm sure Nikki has done bereavement as well, um, people say, why didn't anyone get my loved one to this, these programs ahead of time? I, my, my husband was on hospice for two days. Um, no one ever mentioned palliative care. He was so uncomfortable to the very end of his life. No one talked to our children about what was happening. We didn't have anywhere to turn. That's what you hear. Um, in a city like New York, where it's really the mecca of palliative care um, and hospice care with many, many different programs, insurance covered, uh, Medicaid covered, um, there are definitely access and disparities, but there is a large swath of people who are covered for this care um, without out-of-pocket uh, expenses. So in terms of you know, the, the kinds of clients that we see, um, it's absolutely a shame. Mickey's program is free. There's a similar program here in New York called the Share of Escape Center, which is also free. Um, so there's all this stuff out there, and social work in the hospital is free. People don't get to it because of this idea that I have to be giving up on myself in order to get care, and that is not the case. Um, and I think, in fact, a lot of, uh, of your work as a social worker is the time spent educating people and finding with every different family and client the right entry point. How do you talk about this? How do you kind of separate, how do you teach people that palliative care is not hospice care? And it's, um, the issue is actually kind of deep because there are also a lot of doctors who aren't that well educated about the distinctions between the two. So you probably have read a lot about laws changing in New York, the Palliative Care Act and so on. So now doctors are, uh, by law, they have to have palliative care discussions with clients. However, what's evident is that this is something very hard to follow in terms of adherence. So it's a really an interesting time because palliative care is becoming more um, out there and, and the opportunity for access to it. Yet it's a time right now where there's still a lot of confusion about it and part of our role is an educational role, ongoing. Yeah. Okay. You want to add on something? No. So I thought maybe we could ask each of you to spend a little bit of time talking about the organizations that you're involved in. Either um, you touched upon already professionally, but maybe there's some other organizations that you tap kind of volunteer work or you go to for your own strength in terms of building your professional group. And also relates that the role of certificates um, and other sort of credentials that are out there to um, more kind of round yourself out and, and also gain extra expertise in the areas that are very mm -hmm. interesting. Do you want to Um, and so I have patients who are coming in um, that 
just found a little bump on their, you know, cheek, you know, a week ago, and they're just coming in for their initial consultation to working with individuals, couples, and families um, facing their end of life and everybody in between. Um, and so we we have a palliative care team. Um, as we actually call it. I mean, there's a palliative care team in the hospital on the outpatient side. We are called cancer support services. Um, so there's social work. We have nutrition. We have chaplaincy. We have pain and pa actual pain and palliative um, specialists uh, or physicians and a PA, a, a physician's assistant, and um, a psychiatrist. And so we, as a team, um, try to hit as many people as we can and um, start like. Dr. Vino said, from day one, um, palliative care starts the second a patient walks to the door, at whatever point they are. Um, that's a relatively, I don't know, it's not as new anymore, but it's still in lots of places in this country, and probably still even here in New York. It's a new concept, because again, as culturally, we kind of think of it, it's like, oh, it's near toward the end, that's where palliative care starts. As far as we're concerned, our culture, our, our institution is it's the day you walk to the door, and it starts from there. Um, yeah, and I'm just, I had asked you to start because I wanted to just, I think that many people think about palliative care sort of served in a medical setting like a hospital. Mm -hmm. So I thought it might be easier then to describe what I do because um, just because there are different settings when you're looking at where, how could you work. I work in the community and so uh, before I said that we're sort of, we do palliative care work but we're not part of um, a, a team like you would find in a hospital. So we don't have nursing, we don't have a doctor. So we're, um, and we go into people's homes, but we're providing the social work piece of it, um, and we're connected to an agency. So it's just another phase of how palliative care might be served, and you have also home health services that like VNS, VNA, that often have discrete palliative care programs at this point and might serve it in the home. So anyway, that's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, right now we are the hospice and palliative care home service that works through Beth Israel is called Metropolitan Jewish um, Health System or Health Care System. Um, and actually, they're the only ones right now. VNS used to is a nurse service of New York. But um, MJHS right now are the only ones who have an actual palliative care service that goes into the home. So they have regular home care, they have palliative care, and then they have um, hospice care. So they're sort of unique in this uh, in the city and probably in the country in lots of ways still, unfortunately. So there are lots of venues that you can do um, exercise palliative care in. And part of the course I'll be teaching is to say that it doesn't matter where you end up working, I think you should have, you know, part of the genesis of this course is that in graduate school, you're not often getting a lot of um, palliative end-of-life care teaching. You might be able to take an elective or two that sort of focuses on a particular area. Like I took lost grief, lost grief and bereavement. I think it was a course. Mm -hmm. where, yep. Yeah, Levine, Alan Levine. Okay. You take him if you've got a chance. He's amazing. <laughs> uh, and he teaches group also, I think, still. Um, but there are courses, you know, electives. But in your in your in HB, you might get a little bit toward the end of that course series, uh, talking about end of life and high issues. But when you graduate, you're, you're you don't have a lot of that information. And so again, no matter where you end up career-wise, um, to have a little bit of that skill set, practice clinical knowledge under your belt, um, I think will benefit you. Because everyone experiences loss, everyone experiences uh, illness and pain and suffering at some points in their life. So it's good to be able to help your patients with that. And I think another great resource that I have found over the years, I'm very lucky our agency is very generous in having us go to conferences. But if you're thinking you might you might be interested and in, you know you want to know more, conferences can be such a wonderful resource to hear different speakers talking about things you never dreamed of um, uh, that are part of this work. So that can be also something that can be really helpful if you're in a place of you're not sure if you want to go into this work. Um, and there's a conference coming up. Twenty nine. Twenty nine. That's it's a co-sponsored by the Zelda program here in Sloan Kettering. It's at Sloan Kettering. I think it went out on Courtney's email to students. Um, it's a half-day conference. It's $10 for students. Um, and that will sort of, that's talking about people with advanced cancer, um, in, in, including children, and both individual and group work. So yes, there are conferences out there. There's Darren's, because we get a lot of calls to the School of Social Work saying, 
I'm not, not doing palliative and life care, but I, I really want to know something about it. I didn't have anything about it in school, and so that's why we're having this sort of introductory course. You mentioned children, and I think that's another important thing to think about again. So many people uh, join palliative and hospice care together, but they also often think palliative and, and hospice care is only for adults, and that's not true. I mean, I know we're talking about geriatric, and, uh, but it's also, if you're interested and you're ready and you have a you know, you're jumped in the work for children with, with children. There are lots of palliative programs and hospice programs that, that meet the needs of children as well. So, so I was thinking that with the line of work that you guys are in, it may be incredibly rewarding, but you're also experiencing and being exposed to a lot of sadness, a lot of loss, and then just as your patients or clients are experiencing loss, you too secondhand, you know, vicariously are experiencing it as well. And so the topic of burnout is true probably for everyone within the social work profession, but I'm thinking particularly with this discipline, um, you might have the likelihood of experiencing burnout even sooner. So I thought perhaps as we sort of shift the conversation, not only from what you guys are doing, but also what those of us who are prospectively going to be going into this field, you could share, you know, what is it that's worked for each of you with regard to preventing burnout, and maybe some tips and tools that you think that we could think about taking off ourselves as well. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, you've been doing this the longest. Are you still doing it? <laughs> um, most of the burnout literature talks about that one of the hedges against burnout, besides having a balance between work and um, and home, and really being very clear about that and taking good care of yourself, is also doing a diversity of things and continuing education. So for me, I think what's kept me in all over the years is that, so first I was doing it just myself, as you all when you graduate. Then I thought at some point, gee, I'd like to have a student. So then I took a student, became a field instructor. That then connects you with an academic institution. And so then you're doing your own, your own work with clients, but you're also sort of passing the torch, if you will, to the next, to the next group. So that, that, and that sort of revitalizes you when you think and the students bring so much. And so that's really a, a mutually beneficial. Um, thinking about other ways, so then later on, I, you know, adding groups, adding different things, so that I wasn't just always doing one thing. Then I began to say, okay, I'd like to try some bereavement work, because I was only doing, working with families and patients in their homes. And so then I moved on and at the same institution at the hospice, and they let me start to do some bereavement. So eventually I segue from just doing hospice to almost exclusively doing bereavement. Um, so part of it, and then going back to school and taking classes, I also have, um, continue to have um, a peer supervision group. Um, supervision is really important in this work, um, and it's expensive to buy privately, so, um, and, and I think supervision is eroding, unfortunately, um, out in the field right now. So I did have, a, had a private supervisor for many, many, many years that I paid for out of pocket. But I also have a group of colleagues. Um, I have a, I actually have two peer supervision groups, it's interesting. One is those of us just doing palliative end of life care. Um, and then I'm in one that has nothing to do with palliative end of life care because sometimes when you specialize so exclusively in one area, you forget, you don't always recognize what you don't know. And so the other group will be sooner to think, maybe that client that you're seeing has a substance abuse issue, and I've not even thought that. So I have these two groups, we meet monthly, and we just, it doesn't cost anything. We, we even meet at, meet at a Starbucks, and we meet at someone's house, and we just rotate where we go, and um, we talk about clients, um, obviously not using names or anything like that. And so that, that keeps me grounded, but nothing keeps me as much grounded as making sure that I take care of myself, which is that I don't see clients on the weekends. I really try to have that time very sacred for my family and, my, and things that I want to do with friends and try to be really clear. I also, since I only have a small practice, I, I have a certain, I know at this point how many people I can have in my practice before I'm over the edge between working very full time here um, and having practice. So I'm not always, you know, I try to do my best at it. Um, different times, periods of time, you, you don't do so well and then you have to kind of talk to yourself and start again. Thank you. Do you have things to add? Similar to yes, I mean, I think how uh, Dr. Garbino was talking about doing diverse uh, things within the field. 
I also found for me that working with other populations, uh, working in a large agency, I've had the chance to do that. So I have worked at a mental health clinic and um, I got quite involved with DBT, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy, which is for a population of people with borderline personality disorder. And having that balance and also working and having um, individual group agreement clients in the clinic, uh, and also people who just came in, you know, with, with depression, anxiety. This was a really great balance. And in fact, of course, as Aaron was pointing out, you know, really honing the clinical skills so dovetailed with, with the ongoing work with people who are ill. Um, and then two other things, really important, and it doesn't matter, I think, what you're doing in social work. Be, be sure to take every vacation that you get. Because <laughs> I have found that many social workers don't. And in my agency, people would say, you've got to take them. And it really matters. So do that. And the other one is, if you're somebody who loves to laugh, and I don't know, I have found in the palliative care and of life world, a lot of people who have great senses of humor. And in dark my humor. Dark, <laughs> dark humor. Dark <laughs> humor. And laughing. So I used to handle stress the first few years, sometimes with very difficult cases, by eating a lot of sugar. And then I realized this is not <laughs> optimum. So what I developed is a different kind of little addiction, which is I love to watch those videos on the internet, like animal videos, or the ones with babies. I know it sounds really crazy, but I just so I can laugh. So every night, just about, I will go into my email, and then I'll click on that just so I can laugh. So I would say laughter, There's making more room for it, yeah. like just making sure you have a lot of laughter is yeah. essential. Don't you think? Yeah, I don't see any of those movies about dying and divine wit on Broadway. Not, nothing. I'm not interested. None of the medical shows. I, I completely, I don't read. I read novels. Um, I'm not interested. Um, I, I have that in my life. I don't want that. So it's really thinking about, and Nikki's being very modest. Nikki's also an artist. And so I'm sure that that helps too with your. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so. Very yeah. creative. Yeah, anything that you love to do, make sure that you just keep doing it. And it's very easy, you know, working with other people. They're, I don't want to say that it's seductive. It's just so compelling to work with people who can really, um, that this relationship is important. And you can find yourself kind of giving up little pieces of yourself easily. And it doesn't even feel bad. But then cumulatively, it's like, the classic, the car running out of gas. So making yourself keep up and doing all the things you love to do is essential, I think, for the long term. Yeah, I like, um, like what you're just saying. I think that hopefully all of you, by virtue of being students in the School of Social Work, have a certain level of passion to be a social worker. Um, to be a palliative social worker, I think, requires a very distinct sort of passion. Um, and I think you need to have that in order to be good at doing that and also to have a long career at that. Um, if not, it's going to be short and burned out very quickly, I think. Um, but it also creates a, a, a tricky part, like what you're saying, Nikki. Because you have that passion, you want to give a lot of yourself and you want to help folks who are obviously in, 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 in great need. Um, and there comes you know, the dilemma in having to make sure that you do have that balance. Dean Susan, Suzanne England, I was the dean here when I started in 2001. And she said at the, uh, I don't know, it was like the opening ceremony thing or whatever for the student body, she said something that seemed so simple at the time, but it, it still resonates with me, that as you go through your, your coursework and, and on into your careers, that don't forget that this is a job. This is just a job, or it's just you're a student now. It's not your life, you know, it's a part of your life. And she said, you know, carry a book with you that has nothing to do with social work or nothing to do with um, your particular interests uh, as a social worker on the train, wherever you're going, so that you have something else to focus on. Um, you know, I, I, and that stayed with me. I mean, you know, when I was in my second year internship here, all my fellow students were like, I can't believe you're doing that. You're, you're nuts. How do you deal with people dying and sick all day long? And they used to call me the death guy in the hallway. You know, here comes the death guy. Because um, nobody else was doing it when I was in school with that. And, but her words and just understanding that, again, this is a nine to five job, you know, um, you, it's not like you can turn your brain off and you don't think about a patient at three in the morning or something, but you really have to avoid that as much as possible and have 
and exercise the other parts of your life. You know, have other interests, and certainly, and I agree with what both of them have said so far in terms of diversifying your your career and looking and going to conferences and getting education ongoing. That is certainly helpful, but also pursue your other interests in life um, and keep that balance. Um, supervision is key. Um, and not just like administrative supervision, get a supervisor that knows how to work with your kind of transference. Um, because you're going to have a lot, to know, um, especially working in this field and really as a social worker in general. Um, so find a social a supervisor who knows their clinical stuff. Um, it's really important. So when you're interviewing for a job, interview them hard um, and make sure that they value supervision and value that support within the organization. I thought I would go ahead and ask one more question, you guys, and then um, just as I'm starting to ask the question, I would also suggest that those of you listening on the table maybe think of some things that you also are interested in here, because we're going to take a little bit of time, so make sure we can ask our folks here uh, to share with us their thoughts. So I guess the last question is we focus a lot so far on work with an individual client or patient, but I was thinking that a, a key aspect to the discipline is probably working with other loved ones, be it family members, friends, neighbors, whoever comes to the, the bedside, so to speak. And I'm just wondering, you know, in, in situations where not everyone is on the same page, how do you really handle that? And an extension of this question is really when you think about the kinds of work to be done, some of it's more clinical in nature, and it's helping people, whether it's the family members or the individual, deal with that sense of loss. But then part of it is like the concrete stuff, and what comes to mind are advanced directives, so putting in place a healthcare proxy, putting in place a power of attorney, someone who's actually can you know, make decisions for someone when they don't have that opportunity. So how do you balance between the concrete and the clinical and between the needs of the individual and the larger family? Big question, but uh, this is kind of Let me just, a little bit. Yeah. for reasons of semantics, yeah. um, when you were saying advanced directives were concrete, they're extremely clinical. Okay. Yeah, um, because, <clears throat> I mean, even I mean, any concrete services has a clinical component, certainly, so concrete services are clinical. Um, you have to know your clinical skill set in order to be effective, uh, you know, practitioners of concrete services. But um, doing advanced directives, there's a lot that comes up yes. clinically during that for the individual, for the couple, for the family. And often, like you say, there are folks who are not on the same page for lots of different reasons. Um, and you could have a family member say, well, you know, she's not, why, why would we have to pick out a healthcare proxy? She's not gonna, she's not gonna die anytime soon. What's the point of that? Why are you making her think about her end of life? You know, on and on. Um, I think a, a, a strong clinical aspect of working with families who are coming from different perspectives is understanding what is that perspective? Why is it that they have that? What's that coming from? Is that a cultural issue? Um, you know, there have been other folks in the family that have died or had an illness. Um, that wasn't didn't go well, and so they're thinking about that, and really has nothing to do with the current circumstance. Um, there's lots of stuff to explore um, when you're working with couples, individuals, and families. Um, and I'm thinking also that these, if you're speaking directly about advanced directives, that there's a, a large part of it that isn't about end of life in itself. I mean, from my point of view, I'll say to to clients, I said, you know, anybody who is 18 and older should have a healthcare policy. They should, they should have advanced directives because once you are no longer under the auspices of your parents' care and direction, anything can happen to anybody and you just, and so that often is a way to kind of uh, deflate, you know, the, the anxiety around what this is for. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, so, and I think that you know, sometimes you know, using yourself in your own experience with with uh, doing an advanced directive, if you've done it, can be also very kind of comforting for people. And uh, that it isn't, you know, just sort of like we were talking about before, where um, well, actually, I think we didn't really touch too much on what the uh, the hospice conversation, talking about people about hospice and how it seems to be, you know, people just see a red light, I'm dying. And uh, it's really in how you have such a conversation that uh, that makes it available to people. And same with advanced directives. It doesn't have to be the end of life conversation. It can be that this is like you know something that we are uh, entitled to by law. It's a real gift for us to have it, to be able to direct our care, um, even when we can't speak for ourselves through the mouth of somebody else. We do need to like family work in this field. Um, 
whether it's working with older adults or working with younger, and my practice spans from teenagers on through older adults. Um, you have to be very comfortable with family conflict um, and being able to be a mediator of that. Um, and you also have to be someone who is okay working um, in, the, in an unknown terrain is probably the best way I can put it. That there's nothing predictable about this work. Um, and that um, you're going to be in line of fire sometimes when families are angry. Um, you're going to sometimes disagree with your team colleagues, um, sometimes with the physician, sometimes with the nurse, sometimes with another social worker. Um, you have to be very comfortable in, in a host setting. Uh, most, of, most of what we do is in a host setting, um, which means that the main reason that the agency exists is for medical care, not for social work. So you're, it's not a primary, Nikki's agency is primarily social work, but that's an unusual program. Um, you have to be really, be pretty um, comfortable with ethical dilemmas that have no answers. Um, and that, that only have sometimes the least bad answer of a whole host. There is no good answer for a young adult, for example, who wants to die at home with their children around, and the children are saying they don't want to see mom die in the house. And so then you are caught in that terrible conundrum between what does the patient want, what does the family want, what's going to affect the children later on, what's going to be the effect if you take, if the person has to leave the house, how can you put a young person in a nursing home, and all those, you have to really be willing to go pretty deep clinically. It's, the, it's very, very intense clinical work, um, including advanced directives, ordering a hospital bed, um, telling someone that they, that they can't sleep in the bed that they've slept with their partner for 50 years and now they have to go into a hospital bed with bars and um, people think that's just, oh, that's just discharge planning. Just, order the, just order the bed. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is crazy to think that. So when students say, I don't know if I want to go in the hospital because all I'm going to do is discharge planning, my like hair turns straight. <laughs> I, just, I just go crazy because there is so much clinical work in discharge planning and services. I mean, it's just, it's probably the most challenging clinical work that I do. Um, to do it right. To do it correctly, yeah. And to do it respectfully, that's really, to, to really say, you're not just coming in. Yeah, right. Anybody can come in and, and that's what's happening in hospitals. You'll need a graduate degree to do that. Right. <laughs> and, and I hear social workers say that. It's a very, saddens me to hear people say that. Anybody can do that. Well, not really. Not if you're really thinking about the person and environment and what that means to be bringing in any kind of medical equipment into someone's home. Another part of your question, too, is you know, we were talking to Tubbs on earlier this whole sort of uh, mainstream American culture of macro understanding of illness and end of life. We're not good about that in this country. A lot of cultures aren't. Some cultures are a lot more advanced than we are in that regard. And so when you you often have family conflicts that come out of that lack of understanding, lack of just pure knowledge. You're starting from ground zero, like the most basic understanding of what illness and loss represents to this individual, this couple, this family. Um, and often they're coming from different understandings, different perspectives on that, different generational understandings of that. So you're dealing a lot with culture, um, even your, our own mainstream American culture. And you know, where we work, we're specialists in head and neck cancer, so we have people coming from all over the world. So it keeps me on my toes, you know, when you've got 155 recognized countries. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously I don't know 155 okay. countries and understandings of loss and illness, but you know, you have to go search it and look it up if you don't know it. But um, you know, you have a lot of cultural dynamics mm -hmm. that come into play, mm -hmm. and spiritual dynamics that come into play. So definitely appreciate bringing those perspectives, and thank you also for highlighting the piece that the concrete services are not just concrete and how much is involved and often we know that the concrete service is the way that we get into some of the other things as well. That's so, um, you know, think Maslow's hierarchy, if someone doesn't have their basic needs being met, they can't really talk about Absolutely. the other things. So right. point all things Absolutely. Again. And I think also, with, I have to say, I love concrete, uh, like trying to help with the concrete needs because often that is what the people, like, it is something that is so literally concrete that may change the quality of life. Mm -hmm. And um, just what we were talking about before, which is that he's had you kind of balance some of the stresses, it is very satisfying to order. When, when you've had that conversation to get the bed in there and the person finally can have the comfort that they 
that they need. And there's so many examples of that. But I know that the issue of clinical versus concrete, they are so interrelated. And they also stand alone and is something as a social worker that can give enormous satisfaction. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm just going to ask if anyone has a burning question or thought they want to share. We have about 10 minutes. I wonder if you could speak about the um, postmaster's certification program and whether you um, and whether you recommend you know getting right into it. If it, you know this is the work you want to do, or wait a little bit, work a little bit. You have to have two years of post MSW experience oh. for the for our postmaster program, not for Darren's introductory course. That's for anyone. Um, and both Darren and Nikki are graduates of that class, so you, you might want to say something about it. Um, yeah, I mean I, I did it and. Um, I did it, one, because I recognized I, I needed a lot more training and, and knowledge and understanding about the, the field. Um, it also doesn't hurt to have it on your resume when you're going out and looking for jobs. Um, you've got some great faculty in the program. Um, and um, it's definitely, if you know this is what you want to do, um, that's, I would certainly encourage you to take that. That's a good program. You know, if you're just not sure and want to have a you know a little bit more understanding of just basic principles, then you can take my course, um, and that may encourage you then to take the this course. Uh, but it's a, it's a great course. And if you're not staying in New, if you're not staying in New York, um, Smith has a certificate program as well, and I teach in that program as well. And that program is structured that you go to Northampton for two weekends. And then there's some supervision in, in the in the intervening six months between the two weekends. So I teach the practice seminar in our program, and I teach the practice seminar at Smith. So I know that program well because we may have people here that are eventually going to go live somewhere else, and not our for our program we really have to live in the tri-state area. So if you think, gee, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going back home to California, and what am I going to do? The Smith program makes sense because it's it's what I have in my class at Smith is people from all over the country and Canada. So it's not we're not the only possibility if you're not staying in if you're not staying in New York there is that other program. So we're the only two programs, as far as I know, in the country that's a, that are postmasters, MSW, um, social work. There are lots of fellowships that are interdisciplinary. There are a lot of other programs out there. But if you want for nursing, for interdisciplinary. But if you want social work, it's us and Smith. And Smith's a great program. Great. Questions, anybody? Comments? Yes, Thought? please. Um, to build on uh, what Darren was talking about with the uh, cultural differences, I've just found that uh, in my experience in social work really huge. Is um, this just cultural misunderstanding by um, the caregivers and the families? Uh, is there a lot of cultural competency training in uh, palliative care? I, I dislike the word cultural competence. I'm probably the only one that does, because I don't think it is possibly be competent. Um, I think what we try to teach in the postmasters program and in our teaching here is really cultural humility, which means that we come to that dyadic encounter with someone from a different culture or even the same culture as us with the with the with the attitude that they're the expert and we're the learner. So that's really sort of how I think about culture. Um, and so it is there is that they're not going to know everything. So we, we certainly talk, you need to talk to people about what they're bringing to their illness, and that includes culture and, and religion and faith and all of those things. So um, yeah, we talk a lot in our programs about sort of the Western aspect of medicine and how that is completely um, not helpful for many cultures. And particularly in hospitals, the whole issue of patient autonomy is also not always culturally relevant. There are many, many cultures where decision making is either in a group, a group of family or a tribe, or um, or it's delegated to the eldest son in some cultures. Um, and Western medicine insists that the patient be informed about everything. The patient has to make the decisions, and that's it's a real blind spot in terms of the cultural, the sort of clash between culture and ethics certainly not appropriate in many cultures. So some cultures are not even appropriate to talk about diagnosis, never mind prognosis. So if you come to working with a client who's either the same or different from you, it doesn't matter, with the stance that we're the learner and they're the expert, they're the author, if you think about narrative work, they're the author of their own story, um, then the cultural pieces come along with it. And I'll say to people, you know, 
please tell me about, you know, what is important to you about your illness experience that has to do with who you are as, as a person and, and as part of a particular culture. That's true whether it's my culture or not, because it, it, it's so individual. Right, your family's culture in regards right. to illness and pain and suffering, or right. you know, your community, your church's right. culture, your ethnic culture, there's so many levels of culture. And like what you said, it's really important that social workers were taught to be great questioners, right? So, or, you know, asking, how, tell me about, what, what does this have, what having this illness mean to you? What, what, what is this about for you? Spiritually, what how is this impacting you spiritually? They and then educate, just tell me what it's like for you. You know, I, I can't imagine what it is. So tell me. What lots of programs say is, okay, if you're from this culture, here's what happens with illness. And it's okay to read those books, and they're out there. But it doesn't usually have much currency for me when I'm actually sitting across from someone. Um, especially, I think that there's a lot been written recently ethically about the clash of, okay, I'm from a culture where I am supposed to designate my um, capacity or my decision making to my eldest child, but I don't want to do that. But I don't know how to do, I don't know how to be good in my own culture and yet honor my own choices. So then you get into the clash of. So you can't just say, well, all people do this, because maybe that person is in that culture, but absolutely doesn't want to delegate their decision making capacity, decision making to someone else in the family, even though that's what the culture dictates. And so then you have all of those nitty gritty clinical, ethical dilemmas that make the work so fascinating, is the best way I can put it. A great note, I think, for us to close on. This is a wonderful discussion. I thank everyone who is here for joining and certainly for just for taking the time and um, encourage us to maybe exchange information and continue with the opportunity to dialogue offline. And then on behalf of Rebecca from Student Affairs and myself, the Director of Student Collective, we hope we can do something next again in the future. Thank you. Thank you.